So you also have to balance that with getting enough airflow through here for um, mitigating blister rust. Everybody always asks you a blister rust problem. It's here, but if you keep these open enough, um, it doesn't seem to wipe out the entire stand on you. So it's sort of this balance you have to strive for. Interesting note, um, my supervisor, the forest manager, Marshall Pecor, was telling me years ago before I was here, they did a study where they took some of these mature pine, cut them down and ran them through the mill right along the pith and counted the grain deflections. So every time tip weevil hit it, right in the center of the tree, there you're going to see that grain deflect and they kind of correct. They counted the number of tip weevil hits and they're roughly the same as what you're seeing today. So, you know, they're able to go nice and straight. So in there apparently that they're able to natural streets. They're running around doing TSI 180 years ago. So we try to naturally regenerate these pine stands if we can because it's about half the cost of the planting. So if you have failed regeneration and you have to come in here and plant, it's roughly $500 an acre. So that includes your planting costs and your site prep other things you have to do to get it established, not including the TSI you have to do later on. Um, it's about $250 an acre if you can get the natural seed to just regenerate the site. So we we'll try and get that to work anytime we can. Save some money on it. So because right now the company is paying for all the regeneration on this. So, talk about long-term investment, right? Yeah. Spend the money now, you're seeing the results in 180 years. <laughs> Try to sell that to board of directors anywhere else. <laughs> so we're on AH habitat type here. This is the best habitat type on the reservation. Everything grows really well here if you get it on here. So, <coughs> excuse me. So this was originally scheduled for first cut Sheltowood. I, I don't remember exact year. Maybe five years ago, right about when the housing industry tanked. So what we decided to do is they just cut the hardwood out of it and left the white pine. So we're waiting on the market to recover so we could go in here and continue on the shelter wood regeneration of this. And in the meantime, all the hardwood re-sprouted. This is a site that had the blackberry this tall on it. And the fire couldn't burn in here. They wanted to do a prescribed burn here to site prep it because there's so much slash and still had a lot of the pine in here. So we're stuck in the dilemma on this and what to do with it. So what we did last winter, just this past winter, is we did basically the first cut and the final cut in one fell swoop because we know if we did the first cut in here, again, we're going to be fighting with slash and regeneration. So now that it's opened up, they can get in here and roller chop this and try and get a fire through here if we can get the slash down. 
it's still going to burn pretty hot right now, so you have to wait a couple years. And then regenerate the pine. There's plenty of seed source all the way around it, so, uh -huh. so you're all right. So we took 40,000 board feet per acre of white pine off of this. There's probably another 10,000 feet of hardwood, so there's a lot of volume coming out of this site right here. A couple of ways you guys may be familiar with a couple of ways you guys may be familiar with the way fist is really pushing it now with the bore cut and plunge cut. So I'm not telling you guys anything you don't already know then, but the reason for it is safety and a lot more control. So what they do is I'll cut the notch out of it and you can see the it's on the ground right, right over there what they cut. So it's kind of on a pretty steep angle. If he wants to grab it, you can bring it up and set it on the stuff. So you cut that out of there and then they'll cut, do the bore cut it and kind of cut it from the, the hinge backwards so you always have this holding wood back there. Yeah, there you go. You can see it. It's a pretty steep angle for, you, for your, uh, your notch. And then with this hinge right here, they want to leave enough to control it. But because even with the big bars that they're using, they can't get all the way through, they have to come in from the front. Kind of you said this one. You said this one. You said here. You said in the middle, otherwise you get this column of wood holding in the middle. So then when they're done, they just either cut back or just take that pulling one out and then the tree will go down. So, the problem with the old Humboldt cut where they cut a notch and then cut from the back forward is, is as you're cutting, that tree isn't held onto the back anymore. So at some point it's going to start break maybe before you're even ready for it to. Yeah, and, and the big thing is cut from the back. The conventional cut from the back. And yeah, then the notch could be different on it too. Sometimes they'd have it sloped down to the bottom. So what would happen is, you know, they may start falling when you're you're still right here. So you get a lot of fiber pull in it. Plus it could be dangerous because they're they're racing like hell trying to finish this cut <laughs> as the tree's going down. <laughs> Whereas if you already have it all taken care of in here, you know, you can get your escape ready and just hit it and then just get out of the way. So it's a lot safer. Thousand acres of aspen, another fifteen thousand acres of mixed hardwoods, maybe thirty to forty thousand acres of different wetland types. So it all adds up to just about a quarter million acres of forest that's managed um, actively managed about one hundred eighty thousand. That if you take the wetlands and whatnot out of there, so don't do much wetland management. Um, so the bulk of what's managed then is northern hardwoods. 5,000 acres a year of this being managed. So the white pine that we were talking about earlier, everybody looks at the white pine and thinks, oh, you do a lot of white pine management. We're at least about 500 acres of that a year. So, so about 5,000 acres of this, there's another 1,000 acres or so of even age hardwood management. So red oak and other stands that are managed on an even age basis. So total acreage is about 7,500 acres per year under management, a couple hundred acres of clear cuts, some shelter woods. So. It's uh, relatively speaking, it's a fairly intensively managed forest, but you can't always tell it from driving through here. So, um, so with this hardwood management, we have a full-time marking crew that comes through and they mark this year-round. So this and some of the other cover types, but this is the bulk of what they do. So we manage it based on uh, it's an uneven age management system. So single tree selection, where the order of removal is remove, roughly speaking, remove the worst, leave the best. So over time, what you should see is the um, quality of the forest increasing, right? Keep taking the bad ones out, leave the best. Over time, it's going to improve. So every 15 years, come into a hardwood stand, manage that down to 70 to 90 square feet per acre, and you should see the quality improve. And the CFI data kind of showed that for a while, that the quality is improving. It was the diameter distribution is coming down into regulation, which is unique because most places it's coming up under regulation. It was skewed heavily to big trees. There's still a lot of trees that are on the bigger side here, but it's a little more balanced. But what they're seeing then in the data is that that quality was kind of plateauing. They're still finding a lot of low-quality trees when they come in. So, you know, what the heck is going on? So, in conjunction with some research with the Forest Service, they realize that, you know, you're leaving a lot of your whole size cohort under suppression when you get through it. And so when you release it, that stuff was suppressed for a big chunk of its life and it's not going to respond to that release as well as something that was free to grow. This is an example of that. 
these two cookies are the same age, they're 67 years. So one was grown under suppression, one wasn't. You know, which one do you want to release? So, <laughs> this one right here, different species, but same idea, right? So, what they realize is, you know, just doing pure single tree selection, that wasn't just here, this has been going on in the Lake State since the mid 90s. You know, we need to start putting in some canopy gaps to stimulate that regeneration so you don't have something that's per um, constantly under suppression. So let's just take a quick walk back here now. Right over there. So to stimulate that regeneration every so often, and it varies to understand how often they're going to do it. But they'll find a trigger tree for a canopy gap. It's going to be 16 inches in diameter. And what they'll do is they'll remove all the saplings that are in. We call these things craplings. Because <laughs> that's all they are, right? It's a sapling that's not going to mount to much. Some of these you know, iron wood and stuff like that, it's obviously never going to be a tree anyway. But it's a tree, but even the maple here, it's spending its entire life under the drip line of this maple. So even if you take this guy out of here, the hardwoods that are growing in its shadow, you know, that, that could be a 20, 30 year old tree right there for all we know. Or you get a pole sized tree in here, it could be 80. So it's not going to respond really well. So what we'll do then is mark everything under the drip line. We'll just pull back there, you can see it's got some maple bore scars on it and everything else. So remove all that um, forest cover underneath that drip line and then you have like a little mini clear cut, a little gap in the forest so that the regeneration that's growing in this gap after we leave is free to grow. It has full sun in the, within this opening. Um, we've been looking at these gaps now for the last 15 to 20 years and realized that some of them weren't big enough. Mark a maple crown, maybe that's big enough. But a basswood with a smaller crown is a smaller drip line. So what happens then is you create that gap and the surrounding trees are able to close that gap on you in a couple of years. So, you know, so much for that. So we want to make sure that they're big enough. So, you know, 40 to 50 feet in diameter if we can. So sometimes it to take more than one mature tree to create that gap. So right here, for example, I think these two trees open this up and then you have a big enough gap. So that regeneration there will continue to grow throughout the years, eventually become pole size. You can start thinning those out. And theoretically, at least, at some point in the future, that big tree that's growing in that gap has been there its entire life, free to grow. So it will have never been under suppression. The highest of high risk are all high risk now. <laughs> I think a few of you have snapped off since then even, so take a look around and check them out. Some are pretty big. Yep, I didn't bring a deer. Okay. Please figure out how many people in the cave have their hands touching and then when you get four. Divide by 3.14. Probably two. All our play. <laughs> That's why that pine is there. At one time it was a big open hill. They didn't put the food storage back. Sure. Oh, okay. Hey, Mark. Can you crawl through there? I'm real careful if I want Three.